Gruss, uh, willkommen in einem and in another Fregens video. Welcome to another exciting video, in this case episode 56 of my game system design series. In this video, I'll attempt to analyze what an optimal scenario could or should look like. This is specific or there is a specific focus on micro armor scenarios, but the general rule should apply to other periods as well. This is the fourth version of this video and represents a total refresh of its initial content. When I originally created this video, I only provided a limited number of scenario game systems. Since then, I've discovered there is more than one way to deal with this, and each have their own specific advantages and disadvantages. This version shows some of these other game system or scenario game systems that I didn't include in the first version. I'm certain there are many more, but I hope I've covered most of the most common scenario game systems. Oddly enough, the initial reason I started creating videos was to create scenarios. However, I was rapidly diverted into learning rules, reformatting existing rules, adding optional rules, and creating as many game aids as possible to facilitate gameplay. Re-entering the hobby made me realize how difficult it was to enter the hobby, and my initial strategy focused on making learning rules simple and making gameplay as easy as possible. This did progress into creating a set of rules, which in turn is based on an existing set, which was a diversion I did not expect, and I'm not going to cover in this particular video. But I did finally return back to where I began, which is to create scenarios. When deciding to create a scenario, there are many different types of scenarios you can consider. You could group them into two basic types. The first being a fixed historical scenario. A very common form of scenario in micro armor fix figure gaming is the historical scenario, where some attempt is to identify an actual conflict and use it to build a scenario. The best example of these types of scenarios are in the Panzer Corps sets of rules scenarios. This resembles a board game where the outcome is known and a rough idea of the forces as well with the designer carefully tailoring the force mixes and reinforcements to result in a historical outcome. If done well, these types of scenarios require a significant amount of effort to develop. The designer will need to create a fixed force mix, fixed terrain, and attempt to create a historical outcome with victory conditions tailored accordingly. The advantages of these type of scenarios are that players should have an enjoyable and balanced game with victory conditions which actually mean something. The downside is you need the required force mixes and need to create a specific playing area where even a minor change could affect the play balance. Another disadvantage is the scenario can be played out. After a few games, the scenario may become boring or predictable. While it's possible to extend the life of your historical scenario by adding some randomness concerning force mixes, this will impact play balance. In conclusion, a historical scenario will take a lot of effort to create, will require extensive play testing, and will result in a balanced scenario which has a limited game lifespan. The other issue is the designer will likely be no longer interested in playing that scenario. This type of scenario is done best when the designer expects that many people will play the scenario and is probably best done if the designer is also the designer of the set of rules. The designer is creating an ecosystem for the rules and scenario is a critical element in creating such an ecosystem. I must point out the creation of a historical scenario may be the end point itself. A player or players would typically need to play test a scenario at least six times, which may be enjoyable in itself. These selfless players can create scenarios which can they then can be become available to others less selfless players to try. This is common in the Panzer Core ecosystem and to a lesser extent the Spearhead ecosystem. Within the historical scenario grouping, players can create non-historical scenarios using playtesting to ensure the game is balanced. I group this in the historical scenario zone because the method used are identical, as is the effort. The only difference is the designer will have a vision of the flow of the game in his mind rather than arriving at it through a study of historical conflicts. The other possible scenario system is the points-based system. The points-based scenarios are more open-ended, with each side receiving a number of points which can be expended on any troop types allowed by the period and location of the game. Terrain deployment is often random or built into the point system, as is the initial deployment. 
The most common examples are the Ian Shaw's WRG scenario books, which provide a complete range of nationalities and periods, and coupled with some guidelines, allowed each player to build a suitable force mix. Where, where it was lacking was the actual scenario itself, which encouraged players to conduct meeting engagement, which was almost always not a particularly good scenario to have. Once players realise that a good scenario requires unequal forces, restricted game turn durations, possibly reinforcements and clear victory conditions, the games did improve dramatically. Flames of War took this concept even further and created complete points-based scenarios. The advantages of points-based systems were the force mixes and playing areas were flexible and could suit what players possessed. The disadvantage was there was often a lack of a detailed scenario, and play balance could vary wildly based on the opposing forces. The final issue was this was open to players gaming the system by identifying some sort of super troop type which could easily defeat the enemy using some unusual strategy. Good army lists could minimise many issues, but then these could also add additional complexity for the player. It was generally difficult to quickly create a force mix for an ad hoc game. Not impossible, but it certainly took a reasonable time, amount of time and effort and a calculator and a lot of paper and pen, pen work. One solution was to create building blocks. So if using a set of rules such as WRG, where you would normally command a few companies, you would have perhaps platoon building blocks with fixed points values. Printing this on a card and making the points values as even as possible allowed players to quickly create a force mix by selecting a set of cards up to the desired points value and leftover points could be used for air power or artillery support or could be used to modify the victory conditions. What, it's, what is important to understand is the points system is used to minimise playtesting only. A scenario will still need to be created. The simplest scenario is a meeting engagement between equal forces, with the point system used to determine what is equal. The advantage of this scenario is no playtesting is required, the, and game length can be variable, and the victory conditions can be a simple measure of casualties. Skirmish scale games would use this type of scenario a lot, and it generally worked extremely well. However, once we moved to squad or higher scale, with equal forces, meeting engagements were less than interesting. An attack-defence scenario where one side is outnumbered by a specific ratio is a better scenario. However, it may be less than interesting for the defender. In this scenario, victory conditions become more important, and this requires playtesting. Objective-based victory conditions are mandatory in this case, as is setting a fixed length for the game. The optimal scenario is asymmetrical with variable reinforcements which change the flow of game. This moves the scenario into something which can resemble a historical scenario as historical scenarios will always be asymmetrical and involve reinforcements once we move to commanding a brigade or more. I personally feel this is the optimal system, but does offer play balance issues which may require playtesting. But once you have created this scenario, you can use points to vary the games dramatically. A scenario can allow players to have an ad hoc game with no or minimal preparation. Players can meet at a club, select a scenario and quickly deploy and start having a game. The main issue with points is spending too much time calculating points which can kill the desire for a quick game quickly. So the final critical element is when you use points, they must be implemented in a manner which allows for players to easily and quickly create their force mixes. When we are dealing with an asymmetrical force mix, this can be rather difficult. Once the scenario type is selected, the next step is to ensure it has sufficient detail to be both understandable and easy to use. The exact element types need to be defined, rather than a generic 2nd Battalion of Motorised Infantry. While experienced players could quickly identify what this means, new players are now required to work out exactly what the 2nd Battalion of Motorised Infantry consists of in terms of very specific elements. When the playing area is fixed, as in historical scenarios, an example map needs to be provided with some form of grid on it. This allows the players to accurately create the playing area. The area terrain and linear terrain needs to be defined, so there is no confusion if it's a fordable stream or an unfordable river. As players will possess different types of terrain pieces, the terrain needs to be reasonably general and flexible, especially if dealing with a historical scenario. If we're dealing with points-based scenarios, some general terrain guidelines need to be provided, as placing a river between each side will have a significant impact on the play. 
While not micro-armour, WRG Ancients attempts to create some basic terrain placement guidelines. The same can be done for micro-armour, but will differ by scale. For example, a brigade-sized attack will typically run along a road or flatten easy-going terrain, with the flanks often consisting of difficult terrain or some form of obstacles. On the other hand, the easy path will often include a high density of built-up terrain. If we're dealing with a battalion or company attack, this can vary a great deal more, as the attack could be a small advance which does not follow a road. The next is length of play. For victory points to have any meaning, you need to define the length of the game. In a meeting engagement, this is not really required, but the game itself is not enjoyable and as such is not covered in this video, unless of course you're playing a skirmish scale game, where it does work. My main focus is not skirmish scale, so I'll continue with to not cover this. This can be difficult for many sets of rules, but a good guideline is 8 to 12 game turns for a game. Anything more, and that simply takes too long to play within a day. Victory conditions need to be defined. Early, simple scenarios define victory based on how many enemy elements were eliminated. In some cases, a single objective was also defined. This encouraged players to not do anything. There was very little point in advancing and ensuring you lost as little as possible was critical. The results was constant draws, or if an objective was defined, last minute attempts by both players to take the objective with light forces, particularly cheap light forces, so if they were lost, they didn't lose too many VPs. After more experimentation than I care to recollect, I found victory conditions should be objective-based, either occupying a point on the playing area or controlling a part of the playing area. This conclusion took time in my case, as I never liked objective-based victory conditions. As they forced me to do something I would prefer not to do, this of course was the whole point. If you wish to include losses in VP calculations, be careful as this could drive undesirable behaviour, such as winning by planning on losing less than the enemy. This is a viable strategy, but results in a very boring game. One possible guideline is once a side has lost 50% of all its elements, it's restricted to only defend, which represents demoralisation due to heavy losses. In this case, you may not even need to build it into the victory conditions. The fact that you've restricted the activity of one side after losses may be all you need. Providing adequate scenario game aids is possibly the area most overlooked. Game aids to facilitate the playing of the scenario are critical in the success of a scenario, especially for casual or new players. There are two types of game aids, those which assist in setting up the game and those which assist in playing the game. I've attempted many systems, but currently I've come to the conclusion the best game aid to assist with deployment is one which graphically shows the exact elements which need to be deployed. In this example, here we see the 1943 German attacking forces on a Eastern Front, or in an Eastern Front scenario. In this case, it's part of the Großdeutschland Panzergrenadier Division during the Kursk Offensive. The rules example is LWRS, or Bivugunskrieg. Each element consists of three steps. Thus, you see a three in the top right corner. The element type is in the top left corner. For example, MT means medium tank. The element type is at the bottom, along with a graphic. This is part of an A3 sheet which is designed to be printed, which allows a player to physically place all the elements on the deployment cheat sheet. This ensures each player deploys the exact correct number of elements, and as they are limited or eliminated, they can be placed back on the cheat sheet to indicate losses. While this level of detail may seem like overkill, I have found it dramatically speeds up deployment time. The next type of game aid facilitates gameplay, such as cheat sheets. This does depend on the rules, so rules such as Spearhead would not need this type of game aid, as this is contained in the basic rules. But most other rules which provide different values for different element types would benefit from this type of game aid. In this example, all the element types which could be deployed in a scenario are listed, with all their specific game values. In this case, we see a game aid from a scenario developed for LWRS or Bivagonskrieg. In most cases, this consists of a single A4 sheet, with some rare cases requiring the reverse of the sheet to contain lesser element type values. Both players would have their own element cheat sheet, allowing them to quickly identify game values for whichever element type they would use in the scenario. This speeds up gameplay a lot. 
Rules such as Spearhead does not need this because the element types per nationality are low in number and they already provide a cheat sheet by nationality which covers this requirement very well. This makes Spearhead games flow reasonably quickly. On the other hand, FFT3 lacks this type of cheat sheet, requiring players to create their own. As an example, I'll provide an outline of a points-based scenario. This is an example of a points-based scenario cover sheet. The map is all bling, but does add to the understanding of the scenario. The important information is at the top, which states this covers the period from June to August 1943 on the Eastern Front. The reason why it's important is to define the period, or why it's important to define the period, is to ensure unhistorical conflicts do not occur. The next limitation is the force mix. In my example, each player have, has available the forces typically contained in a division sized formation along with any aircraft available during this period. In this example, the German defensive forces are taken from an infantry division which is fully listed along with points in this chart. Opt optional element types along with the points differences are also listed. This is not needed when playing the basic scenario, but after becoming experienced in the basic scenario, players may wish to experiment with different force mixes and options. This chart allows players to do this, but does require some work and effort from them. For the first play time player, this would be generally ignored, or this level of detail would be ignored. While points works reasonably well for ancient figure gaming, for a microarmor they have enormous play balance, balance issues. Modern conflicts are simply too complex to allow for the creation of an accurate points list system. Points can only be used as a rough guide, which need to be limited by location and specific period. Even in this case, we're bedeviled with problems, which can only be resolved by playtesting. Using a historical building box approach, such as platoon size formations, can assist with this, limit, with this by limiting players gaming the system. In this example, we're dealing with a set of rules which allows us to command a regiment or brigade. A building block could be a battalion, which in this case costs 883 points, if trained. When players build up their regiment, they can only select whole battalions, removing elements if they exceed the points limit set for the game. The only exception would be supporting forces which would typically be broken up and distributed to the battalions, such as the divisional anti-tank forces. In this case, no individual points values for the elements are provided. This is because the values re represent guns, which in this case is 48 anti-tank guns. A player would need to refer to another sheet which shows the points value of the gun and do the calculation manually. This will take some effort. But by forcing historical force mixes, you reduce the risk of point systems being gamed. The simplest solution would be to offer the player a fixed force mix. More than one can be provided with a player selecting the force mix they wish to feel for that specific game. This shows the force mix cheat sheet, listing the forces in text at the top, but also in graphical form at the bottom. If the force mix is large enough, it would occupy the reverse of this cheat sheet. With this cheat sheet, a player can quickly pick out their force mixes for a game, minimising setup time dramatically. This shows the element type cheat sheet. This will dramatically vary based on the rules used, but in this example, the aircraft in, are in a separate chart. The sheet may extend to the rear of the sheet in some cases, but should always consist of a single sheet for ease of use. The playing area needs to be defined, or at least some guidelines need to be specified. I provide a number of example playing areas as well as a guideline for players to follow if they wish to create their own playing area. Depending on the rules, the playing area may be larger or smaller than the playing area shown here, which in this case is 3 by 4 feet. This shows an example from a Panzer Corps scenario. The size, terrain and deployment areas are carefully identified on this sheet. The final, and in many ways the most important deliverable, is the victory points. This requires you to define the scenario, which in this case is one player acting as the attacker for the first day and the defender for the second day. The attacker has a 2 to 1 advantage on the first day, with the opposing player receiving reinforcements equal to the attacker's forces on the second day. That defines the scenario, and this can be a lot more complex if required, especially if creating a historical scenario, but the one I've just described is about the simplest one you could possibly deploy or use if you want to have an asymmetrical force mix. The victory point system I most commonly use are based purely on territory control by the initial attacking player, calculated 
at its maximum advance and then at the end of the game. A wide range of victories are defined, with a draw being the most likely. While this may be overkill in most cases, it's designed for competition use with different competition points being awarded for each type of victory. In a simpler game, any marginal result or draw is a draw and any other result is a simple win or loss. However, providing this level of detail, this does allow players more choice, especially in terms of tactics. Now we come to the most complex aspect of any scenario generation, how to create a balanced, points-based, asymmetrical scenario. An asymmetrical scenario results in the player's force mixes being unequal, with one having, an, one having an advantage at the start of the game, and this being reversed normally later in the game. Historical scenarios are by their very nature asymmetrical, so if that's what you're playing, there's no need to consider this any further. One solution, or the simplest solution, is to vary the points value of formation based on how many game turns it's available for the player. This requires a fixed number of game turns and a robust victory conditions. But if that is provided, we can, we can then assume that if a formation is present on game turn 1, its full falls points value should be used. If it arrives at the halfway point, only half its points value should be used. The attacker and defender is determined by the initial force mix balance the higher points value force mix being the attacker and the other the defender. The ratio can determine if players along the short or long axis of the playing area. In this example, the Soviet mechanized core has a points value of 92 points if it's available from game turn 1 onwards. If it arrives on game turn 4, its value is 69 points and so on. Another solution is to allow a player to double a force mix if it arrives later. In this case, if the Polish Infantry Division arrives on game turn 1, it has a value of 23 points. If it arrives at the halfway point, in this case game turn 7, the cost remains at 23 points, but the Polish gets a second Infantry Division. This system has issues if you wish to have a formation arrive at the quarter or three-quarter point, but this is not insurmountable mountable with some minimal effort from the player, or even specific printer cars being provided as shown. For Ancients games, this is probably the optimal solution if you want to have reinforcements coming in and you want to have their points value affected by when they come in. Whatever system a designer selects, it's critical that it's supported by the necessary game aids to make it easy to use. S trying to set up a game and being forced to cross-reference rules and charts constantly in order to set up and play will kill a game pretty quickly, unless each player is very experienced with the rules. When designing a scenario, you need to mentally go through the steps an ad hoc new player would need to go to, through in order to set up and play a scenario. Only when you are satisfied a new player can do this with minimal effort should you consider the scenario complete. And so... With great sadness, we come to an end of episode 56 of my video on Micro Armor Game System Design, which in this case is all about designing scenarios. Alle guten Ding, kommen zu einem Ende.